Welcome to the seventh edition of Fluent All Kerala PG Teaching uh, Platform in Kerala. And as you know, today we got two eminent personalities as external examiners. <laughs> Dr. Pratamesh, hey, Pratamesh, hello. Good evening, Pratamesh. And uh, he's a well known head and neck surgeon, presently director of PH Head and Neck Cancer Institute of India. And he previously has been the professor and HOD of Hedonic Surgical Oncology at Tata Memorial. He's a teacher for MCH also. And he co edited Propular Pathans Monograph, as you know, co editor of Stellan Marin. And he has written chapters in Scott Brown and ba Bailey and Love. Welcome, uh, Dr. Pradamesh. And Dr. Ajay, Ajay Kumar, professor and head of radio oncology, in radiation oncology in Calicut Medical College. And it's an alumni from Calicut Medical College, and he's got post graduation from prestigious Christian Medical College, Vailu. And uh, as you know, he's a very good clinician, academician, and got many published papers in national and international journals. And we are welcoming you, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar. And as internal examiners, we have Dr. Pramod Menon, Professor of ENT, Dr. Binu Raju George, and me, myself, Dr. Ajay, Professor and HOD from Government Medical College, Fishu. And Today's presenter is Dr. Chirin T. Jose, uh, final year MS ENG candidate from our college, Government Medical College, Prishu. And over to Dr. Chirin. Hello. Hello, am I audible, sir? Ah, Chirin. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, respected teachers and my dear friends, uh, a warm good evening to one and all. Uh, I am Dr. Sharon D. Jos, uh, third year junior resident uh, from Government Medical College, Trishur. And I would like to present a clinical case from rhinology today. And I'm very happy and thankful for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to uh, present this case before the eminent teachers in the ENT fraternity. So thank you once again. Shall I start, sir? Please go ahead. Good evening, Paramesh. Good evening, good evening. So my patient, Mr. Unnikrishnan, he's a 47-year-old gentleman coming from Mannarkad, Palakkad, and he is a manual laborer, presented with complaints of right-sided headache for four months, swelling on a right side of neck for past four months, swelling on left side of neck for one month, double vision for four days, and drooping of right eyelid for four days. History of present illness. The patient complains of acute onset of right-sided headache for past four months. It was preceded by low-grade fever for two days. The pain was intermittent throbbing type, which was radiating to right eye and right half of face. No aggravating or relieving factors and no postural or diurnal variation noted. And there is no history of associated vomiting or loss of consciousness or altered sensorium or convulsions. And the patient took oral medications from a local hospital, but pain was He noticed swelling on right side of neck two months ago. It gradually progressed to size of a small lemon. He complains of similar swelling on left side of neck for past one month. No history of pain or bleeding or discharge from the swelling. He also noticed double vision for past four days and also complains of drooping of right eyelid four days ago, which gradually worsened so that he is unable to open his right eye at the time of presentation. The patient consulted in local hospital again due to worsening of symptoms and he got evaluated and was referred to our hospital for further management. He also gives a history of bleeding from nose two months, in, two months back, which was following forceful nose blowing. Uh, it was uh, two episodes and few drops of fresh blood from both nasal cavities and stopped by itself. He also gives history of nasal regurgitation occasionally on taking food. No history of other nasal symptoms like nasal block or nasal discharge or mass protruding from nose or post-nasal drip. 
no history of change in voice or recent onset of snoring or mouth breathing or no history of decreased sensation of smell or taste he also complains of blocked sensation of his right ear for past 3 months which was non progressive and persistent sensation of block no complaints of other uh, ear symptoms like earache or ear discharge or ringing sensation in the ear or spinning sensation and patient gives history of slurring of speech for past two days no history of facial swelling or facial pain or numbness no history of blurring of vision or protrusion of eye or watering of eyes no history of difficulty in mouth opening or loosening of teeth or loss of teeth and there is no history of deviation of angle of mouth or drooling of saliva and no complaints of difficulty in swallowing difficulty in breathing or noisy breathing and there is no history of trauma or surgery to the head and neck area and no history of irradiation to the head and neck and patient has no history of loss of weight or loss of appetite and he had no history of evening rise of temperature cough blood tinged sputum or yellowish discoloration of eyes or no history of bone pain so we can we stop here sharin yes sir and um, ask you based on all this what is your thought process what are we dealing with in this panel uh considering his uh, presenting complaints uh, it may be uh, some a uh, lesion uh, which is uh, very aggressive because uh, there is a short duration of time that is uh, in four months there are multiple cranial nerve palsies are there so i am suspecting Uh, I request all the participants to please unmute themselves. It's very disturbing for the presenter. Yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Um, so I am suspecting uh, some malignancy, uh, maybe in the nasopharynx, because uh, it is the uh, close closest region to the skull base, involving multiple cranial nerves. what else um some so you want uh, to go back and go to each slide and tell us what what you may what made you think of a malignancy in the nasopharynx uh sorry sir i didn't hear the question yeah so go 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 ahead one slide okay okay so now when the patient to you begins what are you thinking about when the cranial nerves were involved what is your thought process which cranial nerves are involved um since there is double vision uh, most probably uh third fourth and sixth cranial nerves might be involved why not uh, optic now because uh, uh i have to examine uh, i have to look for the vision whether it is impaired no no this is a complaint this is a patient's complaint based on history yes so it could be the second nerve it could be the third fourth sixth okay go ahead So, which are the cranial nerves are involved? Uh, from history, uh, there is a uh, three, four, six, um, and might be twelve cranial nerves involved. What else? You mentioned the patient has a history of nasal regurgitation. Yes. So, ninth and tenth cranial nerves may be involved. right is there you have, you didn't mention about the alteration of speech yeah uh, he complains of slurring of speech but there is no change in voice okay and what about shoulder weakness 
she has no complaint of shoulder weakness right so then we know that there is something involving the skull base and it is involving uh, maybe the second third fourth sixth ninth tenth nerve possibly 12th maybe we are we we are thinking about 10 but we are not sure so it's a multiple cranial nerve involvement patient has neck nodes has neck swelling <laughs> so you came to a diagnosis of a nasopharyngeal growth which could be possibly involving all these structures okay. yes sir so what what could be this nasopharyngeal growth what is the most common growth in the nasopharynx could it be a benign lesion um i don't think so but because uh, there are uh, lymph node swellings on the neck so it might be a malignant lesion and also you need to tell us about the temporal relation so you mentioned about this in the slide also that he first presented with neck nodes and then he went on to have nasal obstruction nasal bleeding and then went on to have cranial nerve paralysis so when you are when you when you are asked about what you are suspecting based on history you need to give the most important symptom first the temporal relation of the symptoms followed by the possible extent of spread based on your history so i understand then i i know that you have taken a proper history based on your judgment about where is this lesion going you also want to evaluate where all is the extent of the lesion so that you can direct your investigations okay dr ajay kumar um and that's fine uh, this case is very early fantastic with all the cranial nerves most of the cranial nerves involved um i think uh, uh, you have uh, represented all the things uh, and sir i think we can uh, let her proceed with the uh, examination sure. Okay. history of past illness no history of similar complaints in the past no history of type 2 diabetes systemic hypertension coronary artery disease uh, cerebral vascular accidents no history of chronic kidney or liver disease no history of tuberculosis no history of bronchial asthma or epilepsy no history of drug allergy personal history my patient is a manual laborer he consumes mixed diet good appetite adequate sleep and regular bowel and bladder habits he is a smoker for past 24 years he usually smokes 4 to 5 bds per day and pack years calculated as 6 and he is an alcoholic for past 22 years 2 to 3 days per week and he stopped 2 uh, months ago family history no similar illness no history of similar illness in the family and there is no family history of malignancies there are six members in the family and he belongs to lower socio economic status uh, can i interrupt uh, okay. oh. yes sir Uh, so you are muted, Doctor Ajay Kumar. Okay, 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 okay. So you you mentioned uh, the family history. Okay. So what is the importance of family history in this patient? Um, since I am suspecting a malignancy of the nasopharynx, uh, there yeah. are ten percent chance that uh, familial clustering of cases will be there. Familial clustering. Um... or is it uh, something related to hla antigens hla happy yeah antigen? genetic genetic predisposition is there okay so that yes. may be the, that may be important okay yes. we can proceed uh one more thing sharan you asked about the diet why is it important in this patient sorry sir why is the diet and his, his profession important um consumption of uh, um, salted fish or other preserved foods that are high in nitrosamine content uh, is, um, associated with the nasopharyngeal malignancy right 
what else um then other etiological factors like uh, smoking alcohol smoking and uh, industrial fumes uh, incense wood so any particularly in any industry a nickel chromium arsenic woodworkers so we are we are looking at a uh, nasopharyngeal growth we are not sure where it is coming from whether it's reached the nasopharynx or is it it is arising from nasopharynx so you should complement everything based on the patient's profession it will cover the tanning industry it covers the chemical uh, industry it covers the woodworker industry as well as uh, you talked about the familiar familial history as well as the diet whether it contains more of smoked and salted uh, fish and other other condiments yeah okay. please go ahead then general examination patient is conscious oriented and cooperative for the examination he is moderately built and nourished there is complete tosis of right eye no pallor or icterus no cyanosis or clubbing or pedal edema there is cervical lymphadenopathy is present no other palpable lymph nodes and his voice is normal vitals pulse rate 76 a minute good volume with normal character blood pressure is 130 over 80 mm of mercury left arm sitting position respiratory rate is 16 bar 16 per minute regular abdominal thoracic and the patient is febrile to touch on local examination examination of neck there is right level 2 lymphadenopathy is present is then which is a globular swelling with smooth surface well defined margins 2 in 2 into 1 cm firm in consistency mobile non tender and skin over the swelling is pinchable i lymphadenopathy is present a globular swelling with smooth surface well defined margins 4 into 4 into 2 cm firm in consistency mobile swelling non tender and skin over the swelling is pinchable on contracting right sternocleidomastoid the swelling becomes less prominent and there is level uh, level 2 lymphadenopathy on left side which is an oval shaped swelling with smooth surface well defined margins 4 into 4 into 2 cm firm in consistency mobile swelling non tender and skin over the swelling is pinchable on contracting left sternocleidomastoid swelling becomes less prominent there are no uh, fistula or scars or engorged veins on the neck trachea is in the midline no obvious thyroid swelling laryngeal crepitus is present and carotid pulsations are palpable on both side examination of nose uh, in the what tender... else sharin what else will you examine in the neck go uh, back yes <laughs> so what do you expect when there is uh, such large neck nodes bilaterally sir sir can you repeat what what else are you going to look for in the neck you mentioned about neck nodes on the right side level 2 and 5 you talked about the left side level 2 you talked about uh, the midline trachea no obvious thyroid swelling and laryngeal crepitus yes yes sir so is there any other thing that you would like to know go ahead um go one slide ahead no <clears throat> go ahead you talked about this no go back sorry
so you need to look out for in any ulceration go go back again go back so you talked about the surface and skin is pinchable on one side so you would need to talk about if there's any ulceration and all you need to talk about the fixity to when there's a such a large swelling you are saying it is mobile how do you know whether it is involving the uh, carotid uh, sheath or not involving it uh, the the swelling will be fixed to the underlying structure uh, if it is involved um, fixed to the carotid so you mentioned the horizontal is, movement yeah you mentioned that it is mobile mm -hmm. you have you have explained it very nicely only mobility in both the planes is critical so when you talk about the mobility if it is in the vertical plane and the horizontal plane if it is in the horizontal plane you know that it is involving the structures but if it is free vertically you know that it is not involving the carotid sheath that it is completely free of the underlying carotid sheath also so if it is mobile in vertical and horizontal plane you know that the carotid sheath is not involved otherwise you have mentioned everything including the uh, the skin go ahead Shall I? Shall I proceed, sir? Please proceed. Examination of nose. Intercanthal distance normal. Nasolabial fold, nasolabial sulci normal. Skin and external osseocartilage in a framework normal. On tip raising, columella is central. Pulse spatula test, equal fogging is there on both sides. An external layer is normal on both sides. Vestibule is normal on both sides. On anterior rhinoscopy, there is deviation of anterior part of nasal septum to right, septal spur. Floor is normal on both sides. There is inferior turbinate hypertrophy uh, on the left side. And right side, lateral wall apparently normal. Nasal mucosa is normal on both sides. On posterior rhinoscopy, I could visualize a pink colored Lobulated mass in the roof and posterior wall of nasopharynx extending laterally on both sides. Eustachian tube opening, coenae, and posterior part of nasal septum could not be visualized due to mass. There is no swelling or tenderness of paranasal sinuses, and sensation of smell is present on both sides. And this is the endoscopic examination of the patient. Here, this is the first pass in diagnostic nasal endoscopy, where you can see the nasal septum and the inferior turbinate in the uh, left nasal cavity. And here, uh, there is a uh, lobulated pink colored mass in the roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx also involving the uh, torus tubaris of the left eustachian tube opening. And I repeated the first pass uh, in the right nasal cavity, where I could see the similar growth in the midline of the nasopharynx. Extending to the lateral wall also. So, I mean, Sharon, did you, uh, that's all you do in the endoscopic examination of the nose? You no, mentioned sir. the first pass. No, uh, the DNA, uh, diagnostic nasal endoscopy involves three pass, but I just included the important findings on it. Okay, so what did you, what will you see in the second and third pass? 
Uh, second pass uh, is uh, medial to the uh, middle turbinate. We can see the sphenoid ostium, sphenoid model recess, superior turbinate. Okay. And the third pass lateral to the middle turbinate. Uh, you can see the uh, maxillary sinus ostium and middle meatus. Right. So it is very important to completely uh, do the examination and document. Because you mentioned that you could not see the posterior coana completely near posterior rhinoscopy. So it's very important to know how far superior the lesion has gone and where it is involving. Especially if this patient has multiple cranial nerve uh, palsies. You know that there is a second, possibly third, fourth, sixth involvement. You want to know where is the superior extent in the nose, whether it's coming onto the cribriform. You mentioned the patient has good uh, smell function, but you need to document it. Please go ahead. Coming to examination of eyes, uh, there is complete tosses on the right side. Uh, pupil okay. is pupil is three millimeter non reactive to light. Ocular movements are absent on right side. Vision is Apparently normal, more than 2 meter counting fingers, and there is no blunting of infraorbital margin. On left side, size and appearance of the eye is normal. Pupil is 2 millimeter reactive to light. Ocular movements are present. Vision is apparently normal, more than 2 meter counting fingers, and there is no blunting of in infraorbital margin. Examination of face. There is complete tosses of right eye. Uh, sensation of the face. There is uh, touch and pain sensations are diminished on the ophthalmic and maxillary areas of the face on right side. Whereas left on left side, uh, sen sensation of touch is intact in all areas. Coming to examination of ears. On right side, preauricular area, pinna, postauricular area, and external artery canal are normal. Tympanic membrane looks dull with grade 2 retraction of pars tensor and uh, impaired mobility. On left side, preauricular area, pinna, postauricular area, and external artery canal are normal. Uh, tympanic membrane shows grade 1 retraction of pars tensor with uh, good mobility. Uh, tuning fork test. Rini is uh, neg negative for 256 and 512 hertz. Others are positive on both sides. And Weber's, Weber's test is lateralized to right. And absolute bond conduction test uh, is same as mine. So my inference is moderate conductive hearing loss on right side. Facial nerve examination intact on both sides. No spontaneous nystagmus. Fistula test is negative. Gait is normal. And there is no cerebellar signs or no signs of meningeal irritation. Coming to the examination of oral cavity and oropharynx. Lips and angle of mouth normal. Mouth opening is full and adequate. Gingivo labial sulcus and gingivo buccal sulcus normal. Gums and teeth shows nicotine staining. And in a two-third of tongue, uh, there is a tip deviation to the right side. Buccal mucosa is normal. Hard palate is normal. Retromolar trigon is normal. Soft palate, the, there is decreased movement on left side. And uvula is deviated to right when patient says up. Uh, both tonsils and tonsillar pillars are normal. Posterior wall of oropharynx looks normal. On indirect laryngoscopy, both vocal cords are normal in appearance and uh, equal mobility. Glottic space is adequate and other areas with a normal limit. Examination of cranial nerves. Sensation of smell. Uh, Apparently normal on both sides. Vision is normal on both sides. Uh, there is complete ophthalmoplegia on right side. So probable involvement of 3, 4 and 6 cranial, cranial nerves. 
and there is diminished sensation of right side of face uh, on ophthalmic and maxillary division on right side of face. So probable involvement of pro, uh, cranial nerve, uh, first and second division of trigeminal nerve. Then uh, examination of seventh and eighth cranial nerves grossly normal. Soft palate movement diminished on left side and uvula is deviated to right. Gag reflex is intact. No drooping of shoulders. Uh, Sternocleido mastered on both sides in that. And tip of tongue deviation uh, is there to right side. So um, 12th cranial nerve is also involved. Coming to systemic examination, uh, central nervous system, higher mental functions are normal. Cranial nerves involved as mentioned earlier and there is no spinal tenderness. Respiratory system, air entry bilaterally, bilaterally equal and there is no adventitious sounds. Cardiovascular system, S1, S2 heard, no murmurs or added sounds. Gastrointestinal system, parabdomen soft and non-tender, there is no palpable organomegaly. So, to summarize, a 47-year-old male who is a manual laborer presented with right-sided headache, facial pain for past four months, double vision, drooping of right eye for the past four days. On examination, there was pink-colored lobulated mass in the roof and posterior wall of the nasopharynx, extending laterally with involvement of third, fourth, uh, first and second division of fifth cranial nerve, sixth cranial nerve, and twelfth cranial nerve on right side, and with moderate conductive hearing loss on right side. So, what's your diagnosis? My diagnosis is uh, malignancy uh, nasopharynx, probably carcinoma. Uh, the stage. T4A, N2, M0, uh, stage 4A, uh, with cranial nerve, multiple cranial nerve palsy and moderate conductive hearing loss on right side. So can you tell me uh, why you labeled this as a T4A? Can you quickly tell me the TNM? Yes, sir. Uh, TNM, uh, TX is primary tumor, uh, couldn't be assessed. TIS is carcinoma in situ. T0 is uh, no uh, definitive tumor, but EB, Epstein Barr virus positive lymph node is present. T1 is uh, tumor confined to the nasopharynx or either extending to the oropharynx or nasal cavity without parapharyngeal space involvement. T2 is with parapharyngeal space involvement or involving the uh, medial pterygoid or lateral pterygoid muscle or prevertebral muscles. T3 is involvement of bone or paranasal sinuses. Um, uh, bone involvement such as uh, skull base or clivus or uh, cervical vertebra or the regard structures. And T4 is uh, extension to the um, intracranial extension or cranial nerve involvement or extending to the orbit or um, hyperpharynx or parotid or any soft tissue, any uh, involvement lateral to the lateral pterygoid uh, muscle. Then right. coming to the, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Then end stage, uh, N1 is unilateral uh, lymphadenopathy, less than six centimeter in the greatest dimension above the caudal border of tricord cartilage. N2 is uh, bilateral uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, now, N1 also include unilateral or bilateral retropharyngeal nodes. N2 is bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy, less than 6 cm in greatest dimension, uh, above the caudal border of uh, cricoid cartilage. And N3 is um, unilateral or bilateral uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, more than 6 cm in the greatest dimension, below the caudal border of cricoid cartilage. And M0 is no distant metastasis. M1 is distant metastasis is present. That was very well described. Um, so the point is how you differentiate this from uh, other head and neck 
neck node staging is there what is the difference difference in what sir between a neck node coming from an oral tongue cancer and a nasopharynx is there any difference in the neck node staging um epstein barr virus um neck node staging. in staging sir yes in staging um in nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, in a neck node staging involves the lateral nasopharynx yeah the nasopharynx you mentioned properly i just want you to tell me what is the difference between this nasopharyngeal end stage and the end stage from a neck node coming from an oral cancer uh, there is a uh, size is more important that is uh, uh, less than 3 is n1 3 to 6 is n2 and more than 6 is n3 and uh, uh, in uh, oral cavity uh, in staging n1 is uh, less than 3 cm in greatest dimension with uh, without extra nodal extension uh, and n2 uh, in n2 n2a is a uh, single ipsilateral lymph node uh, with uh, less than 6 cm in dimension without extra nodal extension n2b right. is go on uh n2b is a uh, multiple ipsilateral uh, lymph node uh, less than 6 cm in greatest dimension without extra nodal extension and n2c is a uh, contralateral or bilateral uh, lymphadenopathy less than 6 cm in greatest dimension without extra nodal extension and when uh, if any node more than 6 cm in greatest dimension or if there is a extra nodal extension it considered as n3 so you will need to read that up because there, this is a old classification in the neck nodes you have got the n3 a and b based on the extra nodal extension and multiplicity of the levels so if it is multiple levels with extra nodal it becomes n3 b the difference i wanted to for you to point out that when there is a supraclavicular region so you mentioned particularly the cricoid cartilage so we are looking at supraclavicular fossa involvement versus not so traditionally in nasopharynx the upper neck and lower neck is differentiated so if you have the lower neck node involvement it is a higher stage disease because it also suggests this patient may have a possibility of distant metastasis so an n3 disease is something which has got a large swelling in the supraclavicular fossa okay uh, can you tell me if this patient didn't have the fourth and sixth nerve involvement what could have caused this patient ptosis uh maybe due to horner syndrome so what is horner syndrome Horner syndrome is due to uh, sympathetic neuropathy characterized by ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, and ophthalmos and uh, loss of cleidospinal reflex. Uh, so you need to mention all that because you want to differentiate uh, Horner syndrome from the third, fourth, and sixth now. Now, lastly, I want you to tell me based on your evaluation. what are the structures of the skull base involved where do you think is the extent of spread you said it's a t4b t4a cancer yes sir so what all structures are involved can you uh, make a logical uh, estimation um since cranial nerves are involved so skull base involvement may be there and uh, parapharyngeal so that's extension that's a given that is skull base so can you tell me which foramina are involved to give you this extent of third fourth sixth and twelfth uh foramen rotundum uh then superior orbital fissure so rotundum will give you what involvement maxillary 
then um, cavernous sinus involvement directly no through uh, sphenoid sinus floor of sphenoid sinus erosion okay what else uh, then pterygo palatine fossa may be involved okay um, so what would be the route of spread for the third fourth and sixth you said cavernous sinus but how would it reach the cavernous sinus um um to the uh, anteriorly um through the sphenoid <clears throat> palatine foramen then pterygo palatine fossa um that can involve the skull base or uh, it can erode the floor of the sphenoid sinus and then involve the cavernous sinus so it would have to track so you want to differentiate a cavernous sinus thrombosis from a involvement of cranial nerves not without a cavernous sinus thrombosis so where would you if you had a direct extension from the sphenoid going laterally it would involve the cavernous sinus and cause involvement of the third fourth and sixth but there is also an element of the facial nerve, facial sensation loss and you have a lesion coming on to the 12th nerve so you would have a posterior and inferior spread of the disease it would involve the greater wing or sphenoid and go via the foramen ovale to involve the maxillary nerve as well as then ascend up into the lateral wall of the sphenoid and go posterior to involve the 12th nerve so the 6th nerve at the petrous apex going down onto the 12th nerve foramen and then <coughs> Laterally onto your foramen ovale. Okay, Dr. Ajay Kumar. Um, I think um, you have represented all the areas. Uh, I was also thinking um, regarding the uh, you didn't uh, Dr. Sharan did an exam for anhydrosis and also temperature differences to look for the cervical sympathetic involvement, even though the there was not much uh, meiosis in that case. I think um, um, I think that's uh, really uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, so you are doing great. Okay, I think we can let her proceed. Sure, please go ahead. Sir, hello, sir. Yeah, please go ahead, Doctor Jain. You want to ask anything? Okay. So now, uh, Dr. Sharin, we have got a case of carcinoma nasopharynx uh, with uh, a T4, N2, and M0. Um, uh, how did you uh, represent this as M0? And uh, I would like to know for T4, N2 cases, what is the chance for metastasis in such cases? Uh, Hello? Uh, there is uh, chance for no, there are no symptoms of uh, distant metastasis. Like? And uh, uh, um, bone pain. Okay. Uh, did you look for the um, pain, bone pain, spine tenderness? Yes, sir. Okay, well and good. Okay, then what else? Then uh, lung involvement, okay. uh, symptoms like of uh, blood tinged sputum. Okay. Okay, so clinically, uh, you came to it is a stage CT4 and to M0. Okay. So, uh, and uh, so what else? Uh, what? How will you proceed with uh, this patient? What all investigations you will do in this patient? Uh, first of all, I would like to proceed with uh, uh, imaging, uh, such as uh, MRI, uh, MRI nose and nas uh, nasopharynx. Uh, with contrast because there is a, a multiple intracranial sorry cranial nerve involvement so to rule out intracranial extension uh, to assess the tumor why, and also why not why not what is about why not ct why you are not doing ct scan yeah ct uh, uh, what is advantage of mri over ct scan in this case patient uh, contrast enhanced ct also be taken sir what 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 are the advantages of uh, CT scan, contrast and CT scan, and what are the advantages of uh, an MRI scan, and which one you will prefer? Uh, 
in ct bone erosion is uh, very much uh, appreciated in uh, ct and okay. uh, lymph node status uh, to stage the disease to uh, assess the extent of the tumor and also it is a cheaper than mri um, again okay. go but for first in this patient in this patient uh, uh, are we uh, worried if you do ct scan sorry sir suppose we do only ct scan uh, can we uh, won't be won't it be difficult in this particular case which investigation which uh, image the best in this particular patient the best investigation is mri yes. uh, no MRI, MRI, that's right i want to know why mri is the best investigation in this patient because MRI has got a, a better soft tissue delineation and also to out intracranial extension yes. and also perineural spread. Perineural spread. That's very important. Okay. Okay. Well, that's the most because it will definitely uh, help us in, st in staging and also for uh, treatment purpose. Okay. Okay. Then proceed. Come on. Any other imaging investigation? Suppose you have got all the facilities in the world. <clears throat> okay. You got everything. So, which investigation will you use? Imaging. Sorry, sir. Which, sorry, sir. I didn't hear you. <clears throat> Suppose you are you got you are working in the, one of the biggest two hospitals and it's free. You can do all the investigation and the hospital has got the best of the facilities in the world. Okay. Okay. So, it's free, totally free, not uh, like here. Okay. So, what investigation you will suggest? I would suggest PET CT. PET CT, okay. Any other uh, image? It has got both the features of MRI and CT, <clears throat> contrast CT. Is there any other? Uh, any other? Have you heard of dual energy CT scan? No, sir. Oh, yeah. dual, dual energy CT scan uh, has got um, uh, the both. It is uh, more. It, it reduces the the contrast dose. It reduces the radiation. So it is one of the best uh, investigations, especially in such cases, such as nasopharynx. But being very expensive, it is not available in most of the institutions. So we go with in this particular patient, in most of the nasopharynx cases where <clears throat> the patient can afford, it's always better to proceed with an MRI scan because of the, the delineation of the, the perineural involvement, the, <clears throat> the foramen involvement, the intracranial involvement, the, the node, the, the, the soft tissue involvement, which will help the, the radiotherapist to a great extent. So MRI usually is the, the, the treatment, the, the best option in, in such cases. Uh, so, so now you have uh, imaging is part, but uh, did you mention the pathology with the most important thing, the investigations? So yes, sir. After, no? after imaging, um, yes. I shall proceed with the nasopharyngoscopy and... So uh, you, you, you have to do PET CT scan also. Why, why PET CT scan is important? Because it's a uh, T4 N2, so there is a high chance of distant metastasis. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that uh, the, the, the aggressive treatment, the, the aggressive level radiotherapy, chemo radiotherapy can be avoided if the patient is having an extensive metastasis in the different parts of the bone. Okay, so in that case, uh, PET CT scan is also very important. Okay, now uh, tell me something about the, uh, the histopathology report you will be getting from the pathologist. Um, in histopathology, uh, histopathologically, uh, the tumor is characterized by uh, infiltration of lymphocytes and plasma cells, especially T lymphocytes. Okay. Okay. So there are T lymphocytes are there. Okay. So what is the uh, what is the histopathology? And uh, also immunohistos. Have you have you have you got the histopathology report of this patient? Yes, sir. What is it? Uh, it was uh, non keratinizing undifferentiated carcinoma. Non keratinizing undifferentiated carcinoma. So, with this, uh, can you give me some light on the etiology? Etiology, there are uh, multiple yeah, etiologies. See, now like, it is um, non NK undifferentiated. Okay. Sorry, sir. The, the Jerry, put up the slide. slide. Put up the slide. Next slide. Your pathology slide. Yeah, that will be fine. 
Okay. Your slides are over. Okay. okay. So you you said it's a non chiral and k undifferentiated. Okay. So I am asking you, uh, does this uh, is this peculiar for any etiology? And just uh, uh, particular one. Yes, uh, non keratinizing undifferentiated carcinomas are strongly associated with Epstein Barr virus infection. That's what I want to get. Okay. So uh, okay, uh, from the general uh, oncologist uh, view. I would like to ask you, are you happy with which uh, IHC, immunohistochemical test you will do to confirm this one? Because we, are, we see undifferentiated, we are worried. It could even be a lymphoma. It's not very uncommon. The same etiologic agent can act on the nasopharynx and produce lymphoma. So what are the IHC thing you will do to differentiate it between carcinoma and uh, lymphoma? Am I clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, tell me. Uh, immunohistostaining will be uh, positive for uh, Epstein Barr virus uh, encoded rib small ribonucleic acid. Okay. Uh, and uh, carcinoma, uh, yeah, cytokeratin yeah. will be positive. Cytokeratin will be positive. And what about lymphoma? In lymphoma, okay. CD8. CD45 will be positive. Okay. Uh, LC, okay, LC will be positive. That's a CD45. Okay, some people will do more than that. That is CD20 and all. But anyway, for the uh, for our exam purpose, we will stick on to cytokeratin or epithelial membrane antigen for confirming it is uh, carcinoma and uh, the LCA or CD45 for lymphoma. So in this, uh, definitely the pathologist would have done that, or they were very confident that it is an epithelial tumor. And that also most likely the Epstein Barr virus antigen may be positive. Okay. So with this, uh, any other investigations you would like to do? Sorry, sir. Any other investigation you will do? Yes, sir. Uh, um, fine needle aspiration cytology of neck nodes. I should do. Okay. Confirm. Is sir. it required? Yes, sir. Why is it required? You have got uh -huh. a diagnosis of the primary tumor. Would you again do an FNAC? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, in uh, EBV positive uh, lymph node, it most probably an esophageal carcinoma. No, you already you have a diagnosis of a malignancy in the nasopharyngeal biopsy. Would you again do a FNAC of the neck nodes? Does it add to your diagnosis diagnosis and his treatment? Does it change your treatment? Yes, sir. How does it change your treatment? Um, so it does not change your treatment. Okay. If you have a diagnosis at the primary site, that's you don't need to further do. Uh, FNAC from the neck nodes to prove that it, it is something else. I want to ask you also when you are doing the EBV titer, um, is there a diag is there is that therapeutic as well as diagnostic or is it only diagnostic? It's uh, diagnostic um, and also for therapeutic uh, for assessing the prognosis. And also to allow to recurrence. Right. So it is very important that you do the EBV uh, study and not uh, and need to ask the pathologist to confirm before you accept the diagnosis. So you mentioned that you would do a PET CT scan. Would it if you don't have a PET CT? How do you confirm a distant metastasis? Um. I don't know, sir. Would you be able to do a distant metastatic workup with a CT scan? Which is the most common sites for metastasis in esophageal cancer? Bone. Bone is the most common site. Bone, lung, and liver. Bone, lung. So if you don't have a PET CT scan, it is important to do a CT of the thorax and upper abdomen in order to cover the spine, the lungs, and the bone as well as the liver. 
So you don't need a PET CT in all all situations. If you don't have it, you can do a metastatic workup. Okay. How do you uh, rule out a lymphoma? If you if you didn't have uh, nasopharyngeal growth, you just had some bulge, but you had obvious large neck nodes. Um. In lymphoma, uh, there will be other groups of lymph nodes may be involved. Okay. And uh, uh, lymphomas like uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, there will be characteristic histopathological findings like red Sternberg cell. Right. So how will you get that on FNAC or a lymph node biopsy? On biopsy. So if you didn't have an azophangeal growth, you would then be required to do an FNAC. And if they had suspected a lymphoma, you would need to do confirm it with a lymph node biopsy. Yes, sir. Okay. So now, how will you proceed with this patient? How will you treat this patient? Uh, since it is a stage four uh, disease, uh, do you I have shall the proceed imaging? with... Sorry, sir? Do you have the imaging in this patient? Yes, uh, only report is available, uh, which was done from outside. There is no film. Okay, tell us the report. Uh, the MRI study of uh, brain with the contrast uh, gives the uh, report as lytic destructive neoplastic lesion involving the posterior nasopharyngeal wall. Uh, the possibility of codom is less likely. Uh, multiple bilateral cervical metastatic lymph nodes are present with a deviated nasal septum. That's it. So that's the impression, sir. But where is the extent of spread? Um, it says a uh, lytic destructive neoplastic lesion involving the posterior nasopharyngeal wall. Hypoindense on T1 weight images. Uh, heterogeneously hyperindense on T2 weighted images. Significantly restricted diffusion. Uh, significant heterogeneous post contrast enhancement. Anteriorly, mild extension into both sphenoid sinuses. Posteriorly, minimal extension into the prepondine cistern with the focal abutment of the basilar artery. No luminal stenosis. Superiorly, involvement of right cavernous sinus with the complete encasement of the cavernous segment of right internal carotid artery. Reaches up to the right superior orbital fissure. However, the optic nerve and chiasma appear normal. The pituitary gland appears normal. No intraparenchymal infiltration. Laterally involvement of bilateral lateral nasopharyngeal wall, right more than left. Minimal involvement of right torus tuberus, fossa of Rosamuller, and opening of right eustachian tube with the resultant changes of right sided. That's also automastoiditis. Right. So it is involving the P is apex involving the clivus and involving the cavernous sinus and the ICA. Suppose this was, what other histologies are known in the nasopharynx besides the squamous cell cancers and the lymphomas? Which other histologies are, in, are seen? Others like sarcoma. Okay. More common. Um, fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma. <clears throat> salivic gland. Any minor salivic gland lesions? Yes, sir. Uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Right. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Hello? Right. Yes. So it is very important to know that, know the extent of spread 
because in situations wherein you may have to offer the patient a surgical resection, you might want to know where is the extent. So is this patient resectable? No, sir. So why is it unresectable? Uh, because uh, there is uh, cavernous sinus involvement and also internal carotid arteries. In so now how will you stage this patient? Sorry, sir, I didn't hear you. How will you stage this patient based on your radiological findings? Stage uh, T4. It's A or B. And is it important to differentiate? Yes. Uh, T4 A. And what is T4 B? When there is distant metastasis. What about intracranial spread, internal carotid artery involvement? Intracranial extension is uh, T4A, sir. Intracranial extradural. Yes. So we want to differentiate from a resectable and an unresectable disease because you want to know going ahead, this is a documentation that is important should this patient fail non-surgical treatment. So upfront, you know that this patient is not resectable. So now how will you plan this treatment? Patient is a stage T4B, N3 disease. His patient has got uh, EBV positive disease and it's a non keratinizing squamous cell cancer. Yes. Um, uh, I shall proceed with the concurrent chemo radiations. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sharin, uh... Considering the stage, uh, what is the standard uh, treatment for such cases? Because this patient has got disease, the, my, the tumor cells are everywhere in the head and neck and possibly in other parts of the body also. No? So to yes. contain those cells, what we should do initially? Uh, induction chemotherapy can be given. Induction chemotherapy has to be given. Um, Followed by... Yeah, at least for the three uh, three courses. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then, so what what are the agents for induction chemotherapy in this uh, patient? We can use in this particular patient. Which are the different agents? Uh, sorry, sir. I which, can't are the, which are the chemotherapy drugs we can use for agents? This uh, okay. Sir. For induction, uh, cisplatin. Yeah, yeah cisplatin plus. Uh, Pyfluorouracil. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, for will the the HB, EBB uh, Epstein Barr virus pattern positivity will change anything for the induction chemotherapy regime? Um, so, in a, uh, there is modified TPF regime is there, sir? Okay. So for EB positive, you uh, the, there is uh, category one evidence for cisplatin plus gemcitabine, and because that is uh, the toxicity is also a bit uh, less than uh, docetax or or taxane plus cisplatin or carboplatin. Okay. So in this patient, uh, because in NK undifferentiated with a possible EBV positive, uh, the best option will be a cisplatin doublet that is cisplatin plus gemcitabine. For this patient and that you can give three cycles and what uh what is the uh, the chance for uh, response okay in this patient after giving three cycles of chemotherapy how much percent uh, you will expect uh, regression of the lymph nodes and the primary um. it's very very sensitive tumor carcinoma nasopharynx is radio and chemo sensitive tumor, up to 80% of the tumors will uh, regress with these uh, regions. And okay, so now in this particular patient, uh, uh, you know, do you know the side effects of uh, these uh, drugs, chemotherapy drugs like cisplatin? Yes, sir. Okay, what are the side effects of cisplatin? Uh, nephrotoxicity, uh, yeah. peripheral neuropathy, autotoxicity, and myelosuppression. 
Okay, so what will you do before giving cisplatin chemotherapy? I should uh, uh, document the yeah. uh, hearing of the patient. Yeah, hearing, hearing, yes, very good. Then and also uh, the uh, other checkup should be done, like visual activity. It's uh, creatine, creatine clearance is the, the single most um, a test you do before administrating cisplatin for such patients to see that their kidney, the renal status is stable. Okay, so okay, so we gave three pay three three cycles of cisplatin gemcitabine. Uh, that is uh, usually you give cisplatin on day one, full dose, and then it will be repeated on the after three weeks. And gemcitabine yes. will be given on day one and day, day eight. One, day eight. Yeah. So that will be again repeated every three weeks for three cycles. And if yes. there is an immediate response, then what will you do? What will you, what is the plan, next plan of action? Uh, followed by concurrent chemo radiation. Okay, okay, okay. That's uh, the thing. So in this patient, any idea uh, you regarding radiotherapy in this particular patient? In this patient, or oh, what are the different techniques? Anything you know about the 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 different techniques of radiotherapy or uh, is it what's your idea about radiotherapy for uh, yes uh, today uh, we are uh, prefer um, intensity modulated radiotherapy okay what is intensity uh, modulated radiotherapy it is a um, uh, it is a method to confer, um, deliver the um, adequate radiation uh, dose to the target, uh, sparing okay. the adjacent normal critical structures. Okay. So intensity modulated, the, the, the intensity, the, the radiation comes from the, the head of the radiation equipment and the intensity of the radiation can be modulated by putting small blocks, lead blocks in between the, on the radiation beam. So in a particular point of the tumor, the intensity can be increased and decreased. That is called, that is the reason why it is called intensity modulated radiotherapy. The aim of radiotherapy basically is to give maximum radiation dose to the tumor site at the same time, sparing the normal critical structures. Okay, so the critical structures in nasopharynx, there are a lot of critical structures in and around the the nasopharynx proper. So, can you tell me the uh, the critical structures? See, critical structures in radiotherapy means uh, certain the the organs which if you exceed a certain radiation dose limit, those organs will fail. Okay, that means they, yes. so those organs will damage. There will be irreparable damage to those organs, and that will be miserable. There will be the life will be miserable. The patient may not die, but the remaining life will be miserable for the patient. So we have to be very careful to reduce or limit the radiation dose to these critical structures. Now you please tell me what are the critical structures with regard to radiotherapy in and around nasopharynx? Uh, brainstem, spinal cord. Brainstem, brainstem. Okay, brainstem is a very important structure because. See, in this particular case, because the clivus is involved, we will have to include the clivus and, uh, you know, the, the brainstem just sits just beyond the uh, clivus. Okay, there, be, there is not much difference between the, the clival part and the, the brainstem. So, we have to be very careful. Okay, so what is the, do, do you know how much dose we can give to the uh, the brainstem? What is the, the limited limiting dose for, uh, maximum dose you can give to uh, brainstem, radiation dose? Uh -huh. 54 grade. Yeah, very good. Very good. That's very understanding. That's 54 gray is the maximum dose, D max. The maximum dose that the brain stem will tolerate to a particular volume. Okay, tell me the other critical uh, organs in and around nasopharynx. Spinal cord. Okay, spinal cord, uh, uh, plus, um, when you are planning to give um, radiation to the neck nodes, it's important. Okay, then. Then mandible. Mandible. What is the dose for mandible? 70 gray. 70 gray. Okay. Any other in the nasopharynx, above the nasopharynx proper in that region? Um, optic asthma. Very good. Optic asthma. Now tell me the dose, the Dmax, the maximum dose that will tolerate, that optic asthma will tolerate. 
45 gray. Yeah, optic asthma, you can go up to 54 gray. Again, optic nerve 54 gray. Okay, these are the structures. Uh, then there's the brain proper because again, here the cavernous sinus is involved and we will have to put our PTV. That means the, 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 the irradiate the certain parts of the brain tissue. So what will be the maximum tolerance dose for the brain? How much dose you can give to brain in this patient? Uh, 54 gray. 60 gray. We can go up to 60 gray because brain tolerance. Uh, okay. And uh, pituitary region is uh, that you cannot go more than um, 45 gray. Okay. So then uh, the retina is there. Okay. So these are all lengths of the, it's very low, low dose you, uh, lens will tolerate. And then as you said, um, uh, then then one important uh, structure uh, concerning the, the future uh, deglutition, future life of the patient. What is that? Pharyngeal musculature. Pharyngeal musculature. Okay, that will tolerate a bit more dose. And any other... Uh, parotid gland. Parotid gland. Okay, that is the most important thing. And that, that uh, this teletherapy technique, that is the IMR has made a difference when compared to the older 2D, two-dimensional techniques by sparing the radiation dose to the uh, parotid gland. Uh, when we were studying, most of the patients uh, got full dose to the parotid gland and serostomia, that is a lack of saliva as the dictum. But now, uh, we can limit the dose to 26 gray. The mean dose to the parotid gland should be 26 gray, less than 26 gray. And with that dose, uh, the patient uh, can have his saliva uh, to a very great extent in his future life. Okay, so that's uh, well covered, Dr. Sharin. You have excellently mentioned. Uh, so, uh, so we are planning. Uh, 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 we, we we are planning to give uh, radiation to this particular patient. Any idea how we will be planning for radiotherapy? That is IMRT for this particular patient. Uh, do you remember? Um, so the question. How we will plan radiotherapy for this patient? Um, uh, before um, dental checkup. Yeah, very, very, good. very important. Okay, that is very important. Okay, uh, so that's very important. The dental checkup has. Uh, Doctor Pratamesh, do you have to add something? Yeah, so I I feel that uh, for the EAT residents, the radiation planning may not be very critical yeah. to know. But uh, they would need, she has done very well and talking yeah, about all really, the, I was, very cool. I was very impressed with her uh, knowledge about the structures to be protected and all. Really? So, uh, um, suppose we now treat this patient with chemo radiation. So, the whole idea of neogen chemotherapy was to improve the uh, overall survival and uh, prevent the, uh, tackle the distant metastasis of cells in circulation reduce the volume of the disease and then tackle it with chemo radiation. So you have now treated this patient with chemo radiation. Now, how will you follow this patient up? Uh, after uh, completion of uh, radiotherapy, uh, I would uh, advise the patient to uh, come after 12 weeks after the uh, treatment for the first follow-up. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us a follow-up schedule. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, once in two months in the first year, then uh, once in three to four months in the second and third year, and six monthly or yearly thereafter. So how will you follow up this patient? With a clinical examination and non-clinical. Yes. So what are things you'll follow up? Uh, in each visit, uh, I will do the anisopharyngoscopy. And uh, if there is a lesion, uh, then I'll proceed with biopsy. And also imaging like uh, MRI will be taken. So you will follow, with, you'll follow up with imaging because yes. that is more critical in this patient. Yes. So what imaging will you do? Um, MRI with contrast. So you're done MRI with contrast first, but now we have to follow up this patient after chemo radiation. So what will be your investigation of choice? Then PET CT. 
Right. Why PET CT over MRI now? We discussed at length that MRI is a better tool. So why would you follow up with PET CT? Um, uh, PET CT is uh, superior to uh, diagnose the recurrence or residual disease. Why? Why? If MRI yes. could tell you about the disease so well, why are you going to PET CT? <coughs> Uh, because it's a functional imaging technique and uh, um, uh, it can You're improve. Right. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it helps to differentiate between the post-radiational fibrosis and uh, recurrent disease. Right. So because of the fibrosis, it's very difficult to understand whether there's a residual disease on, on MRI. Um, and CT scan. So the PET CT will help us. Okay. So you would do anything else you will do? Any other blood test you will do? Yes, sir. Uh, total blood count uh, and uh, renal function test. What else? We talked about certain investigations prior and we said it is therapeutic and prognostic and diagnostic. Any tests you'll do in the follow-up? And also thyroid function test. Uh, you have done some tests initially. Earlier you have done one test, no? And that is there. And you have said it will be done in follow-up also. It's important. So you do, you'll do the EBV titer? Uh, yes, sir. So EBV. is it important to do the titer? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so what are the it, reasons for doing it? Uh, it is a, um, after 12 weeks of completion of uh, treatment, it will uh, drop. Then if it is increasing further, then it may be a uh, pointer for a residual or recurrent disease. Very good. So you will look out for rising titers of EBV, which suggests there is a disease recurring before you see any structural signs of disease. So is there any role of chemotherapy if there is a rising titer? Sorry, sir. Chemotherapy. Is there any role for treatment if there is a rising titer of EBV or would you wait for structural disease to come? Um, if it is a very high uh, APV DNA titer, then uh, it can be cons after 12 weeks, then it can be considered as a recurrence and uh, go for adjuvant chemotherapy. Right. I think that is a, is a right uh, strategy because you are sure that this patient there is enough evidence to suggest that the EBV titer is correlating with the recurrence of disease. Uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, any other question? Uh, we have been talking about this EBV. Any idea how EBV infects the cell, Dr. Sherin? And what are the different types of uh, infection on a nasopharyngeal cell? Uh, uh, Epstein Barr virus infection in if you, uh, if you know it's okay. If you don't know it's yeah. okay. It's, it's a, in human papilloma virus, it's well detailed, well uh, very, very, very simple. But in, in uh, Epstein Barr virus, it's complicated and we do Complex, not know yeah. exactly. But it is uh, two types of infection are there. It can be a, a latent infection into the epithelial cell. That means the the Epstein Barr virus, the DNA can transform the DNA of the cell, epithelial cell, and it can make it work like uh, multiply, okay, uncontrolled multiplication, etc. And the second type of infection is the lytic infection. The lytic infection means it will it will in, again uh, incorporate with the DNA, but the outcome, the proteins uh, and enzymes will uh, lyse the cell itself. The cell will undergo death. 
So these are the two types of invasion, but it's not very clear. Like human papilloma virus, when you come across or of pharyngeal malignancies. Okay, so just for your understanding. Right. So Sharon, we discussed about uh, chemosensitive tumors. Suppose you had a minor salivary gland lesion in the nasopharynx. You, your, what would be your strategy for a T2 or a T3 nasopharyngeal cancer, which is coming from minor salivary gland origin? I didn't know it's a sick carcinoma. What would be your treatment strategy? Uh, surgical resection. Okay. So surgical resection followed by post-operative radiation. Followed by post-operative, yes. So what would be your approaches for surgical resection of the nasopharynx? Uh, there are different approaches like uh, uh, anteriorly uh, transpalatal approach. Then transpalatal palatal approach. Okay. And uh, midfacial degloving uh, and mid uh, maxillary swing approach, facial okay. translocation, and uh, endoscopic endonasal approach, lateral skull base approach. And I thought you would talk about that first. Robotic approaches. Yeah. So you you have the entire complement of surgery based on your experience from an open to minimal access to remote. So you, you need to classify that in that order so that you are very clear. So what are the contraindications for surgery? If there is uh, extensive uh, skull base erosion or intracranial extension or engagement of the uh, carotid artery. Mm -hmm. So extensive doesn't tell me anything. Intracranial doesn't tell me anything. So what are the specific contraindications for surgery? Um, patient, uh, patient's general condition. Okay, patient factors. Then what about the tumor factors? Um, if it is a Location. If it is uh, encasing the major vessels. Which major vessel is here? Carotid artery. Right. So you have to be very clear if it is involving the internal carotid artery. In this patient, is it, it is unresectable because it is involving the internal carotid artery at the second uh, genu and the intracavernous segment. So you will not be able to resect this on all, all counts. So, when you ask about contraindications of surgery, be very clear, specific. One, two, three, four. Involvement of your skull base at the or or foramen ovale. Involvement of the cavernous sinus. Involvement of the internal carotid artery. And intracranial intradural disease. So, you would have to be very, very specific. Uh, what are the uh, limits of surgery endoscopic surgery which when you'll convert it to open um, endoscopic surgery uh, midline uh, tumors can be resected but uh, lateral assess is uh, poor so what is the limit laterally laterally Lateral uh, nasopharyngeal wall. Lateral, sorry? Lateral nasopharyngeal wall. Anything in relation to the eustachian tube? So when it goes beyond the torus tubaris, coming on to the uh, eustachian tube opening, you would have a difficulty in accesses in clearing it laterally. So your third dimension and lateral extension, you will fail. So in those cases, you would want to do an open approach to give you an access to prevent injury to the carotid and to get the third dimension. 
So how will you rehabilitate these patients following a nasopharyngectomy? <coughs> So what are the sequelae of a nasopharyngectomy? Uh, that there might be aspiration, nasal regurgitation. Um, Why will there be aspiration and nasal regurgitation? Uh, because the uh, nasopharyngeal isthmus is So if you cross the velopharynx, you would have a loss of velopharyngeal insufficiency, in which case you will have a regurgitation. What else? Then um, trismus might be a complication. Why would you have trismus? Uh, any injury to the uh, pterygoid muscles. What, what is more common? What about eustachian tube dysfunction? Mm -hmm. So how will you rehabilitate these patients? Uh, you heard of grommet? Yes, sir. So think of common first. So when you ask for sequelae of nasopharyngectomy, the most common would be a damage to the eustachian tube openings or you're resecting it, which will cause the patient to have a eustachian tube dysfunction, which will lead to a serious otitis media and a need for a grommet. How will you uh, restore this patient's swallowing and speech? Uh, Rise to feeding can be done in the immediate post of period. Right. So if you have removed the u uvula, you would have preserved, if you have preserved the uvula. So there are two situations. So if you have preserved the uvula, you would have to wait for the fibrosis and contracture band to be reformed. Till such time, you would have to offer this patient a Riles U feeding or a peg feeding. Once the, if the uvula is resected, how will you restore the patient's uh, swallowing function? So either you would do a free flap reconstruction or you would give a prosthetic rehabilitation. Um, Dr. Ajayan, any questions? Um, Dr. Sharin, uh, consider this patient uh, as having adeno adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is inoperable. Okay, and uh, we know that it's not uh, it's resistant to chemotherapy drugs also and radiation also if there is gross tumor. So, is there any um, is there any 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 other uh, method of treatment for such uh, uh, cases? Uh, any tablet available you would have come across in general in your clinical practice? Have you heard of uh, Jeftinib? An EGFR antagonist. What is EGFR? Epidermal derived okay. growth factor. So adenoid cystic carcinomas are sensitive to EGFR antagonist, Jeftinib. So you can give, and in 80% of the patients, there may be a response. And uh, so that's something, some sort of palliative treatment. Okay. So now we come across the, come, we go back to the carcinoma nasovarynx, and this patient, unfortunately, is having a local recurrence. Okay extensive local recurrence we, uh, we find. So what will be the, the approaches in this case? How will you approach a patient with carcinoma and esophagus uh, who recurs after um, one year or one and a half years? One and a half years. Uh, if uh, local recurrence in the nasopharynx, if it is uh, resectable, then we can go for salvage surgery. And okay. uh, followed by brachytherapy, yeah, brachytherapy uh, is uh, uh, very well established for carcinoma nasovarynx as uh, in recurrent either in a recurrent setup or 
after a surgical uh, situation or even uh, re radiation nasopharynx uh, because nasopharynx uh, after recurrence we don't expect the we don't have to treat the lymph node uh, initial if you follow closely follow the patient if you can detect the recurrence at an early stage you can just give almost the same dose up to 60 gray to the nasopharynx proper uh, with then so re radiation and brachytherapy are the two methods of radiotherapy where you can salvage these group of patients, up to 30% of the patients can be salvaged. Dr. Prasamesh, uh, regarding surgery in recurrence? Yeah, so when we talk about recurrence, uh, Sharon, how will you restage this patient? Sorry, sir, I couldn't hear. How do you restage a patient in a recurrent situation? In a recurrent situation? Yes. Um, how do you stay? The, sorry, sir, I didn't hear the question. What is the notification? What is the ah, notification? Yes. Uh, small R. Right. Small R. So the question Dr. Ajay Kumar asked was, when would you do a salvage surgery? In which yeah. cases you can actually do a salvage surgery, which is worthwhile? Small R T one R T two. Okay. So why do you why not R three three and T four? Um, because it's a uh, locally aggressive disease. There is it is inoperable actually. In T3, no, we are talking of operable disease. We are not talking of T four B. So we are saying R T one T two T three T four. So in a recurrent situation, which cases you would consider a surgical resection? You have already uh, done chemo radiation. Yes. Now we need to consider salvage surgery. Would you do salvage surgery for all or would you consider salvage re-irradiation or re-chemotherapy radiation? Uh, salvage surgery is only for T1 and T2. Because the uh, overall five year survival rate is um, good for T1 and T2 after salvage surgery. Uh, so don't so put your foot in it and say good. Don't put your foot in it and say good and bad. You, if you know the <laughs> the percentages, only then mention it. Otherwise, uh, say that seventy percent. Seventy percent. Okay. Do you have any any data on which you're basing this? Any literature? Yes, sir. Which study? Um, I, sorry, I forgot the name, but it's, it's, it's so when you forget, say meta analysis. Okay. Uh, meta analysis in uh, chemotherapy. So Mac and C nasopharynx, when they looked and the Sun study, they are there are two studies which have looked at the current. And most of the data comes from Taiwan, where they have used the robotic and endoscopic nasopharyngeal resection. So when we are looking at the outcomes for a recurrent T1, T2 versus recurrent T3, T4, we know that the recurrent T1, T2 cancers do better with salvage surgery, followed by concurrent chemo radiation or radiation, re radiation. The ones that are T3, T4 are seldom operable because the complication rates increase, not that they are inoperable. But the complication rates, the sequelae of the surgery uh, are higher, where they, there's a issue of internal carotid bleed, CSF leak, and, and complications. So it is uh, the recurrent T1, T2 would be selected out for surgery, and the recurrent T3, T4 would go in for re-RT si situation. Nasopharynx is one site where the recurrent radiation re-irradiation first began because the surgeons were not suit, didn't find it feasible for surgery. So re-irradiation came um, in starting with the nasopharynx. So you would have better outcomes following chemo radiation and re-irradiation, which are similar to the surgical options for T1, T2. Okay, thank you.
any other questions? Any questions from the audience? I think she said has done extremely well and she's presented uh, her case and she is confidently, you know, answered our questions. Dr. Ajay Kumar. Yeah, really. Fantastic, Sharin. It is really great. I think just for the residents, I would uh, urge you all to focus on the staging because this is a very rare tumor for us uh, in the ENT fraternity and uh, it is more common in the Northeast and in small pockets across the country. So you need to know the recurrent, uh, you need to know the TNM, you need to know how the nodal staging is different from the nodal staging in the other sites in the head and neck. You need to know about the immunohistochemistry, particularly the EPV and the role of EPV in, in causing this cancer. And you need to understand the various nuances of treatment uh, from surgery, chemo radiation, and adjuvant, a new adjuvant chemotherapy. So as you heard, Dr. Ajay Kumar uh, very nicely talked to us about the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and the drugs used. You need not know the schedules and everything, but you need to know that the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is an important part of the treatment, unlike other sites in the body. You also need to know about the surgical approaches for the non-squamous cell cancers. And uh, you will be uh, expected to know about the endoscopic and the robotic approaches. Uh, the follow-up of these patients is very critical. Uh, the method of follow-up, the use of EBV in follow-up, and the role of pet CT and MRI for surgical considerations in salvage are important. And lastly, you need to know about the anatomy of the uh, parapharyngeal space and the nasopharynx in relation to the carotid artery. You are all uh, aware of endoscopic approaches and advances in skull-based resection using endonasal approach. You need to know what are the limitations. So please read up about the anatomy of the palatine bone, the pterygoid bone, and the spinoid. Uh, it will give you a complete understanding of the uh, access, various accesses to the skull base. Thank you. Thank you, Pradamesh and uh, Dr. Ajay. And there are senior professors in the audience. I think Dr. Sadesh, Dr. Shibu, Sujit, Jay Prabha. Dr. Okay, Sadesh, Jay. any comments? Yeah, yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. Dr. Sharin needs uh, uh, appreciation. She presented very well, confident, and uh, knowledge, subject knowledge is also very good. So, and both the examiners uh, covered everything, all the aspects. But I would like to ask her one or two small things, which will be usually asked uh, when you get a case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, number one, in this case, you told you did a post-nasal examination. We know uh, with the COVID situation, so many uh, END residents don't know how to do a post-nasal examination. Everyone will do with the endoscope. So can you tell me how will you do a post-nasal examination? Okay, sir. Uh, patient is seated in front of the examiner and the procedure is explained to the patient and uh, get their consent. And um, um, the um, uh, uh, light is focused uh, uh, to the uh, base of uvula. Then uh, ask the patient to open the mouth and the tongue is depressed with a tongue depressor on the anterior uh, two third of the tongue. And uh, by using St. Clair Thompson post-nasal mirror, uh, which is um, pre-warm and checked for the temperature. It is introduced through the uh, left angle of mouth uh, if, uh, with my right hand. And uh, this mirror is introduced uh, uh, beyond the uh, uvula and uh, uh, without touching the posterior pharyngeal wall, um, I could visualize the in their structures. Okay. 
so you should explain and uh, you should do and uh, which surface of the mirror uh, the instrument St. Clair Thompson or nasal mirror should be warmed and how mirror. will you mirror okay good mirror, sir. good uh, in this case you told presenting complaint was headache yes sir so in a patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma when the main complaint is headache what is the significance headache uh, might be involvement of uh, the trigeminal nerve because it was uh, uh, on the right side of face mainly no that is facial pain that you told but i am asking about headache what is the significance of headache in a case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma uh, it may be due to sphenoid sinus involvement or intracranial extension. Uh, yes. So, is it a good sign or a bad sign? Symptom? Sir, bad sign. Bad symptom. Oh, yeah. It shows that it is a very advanced disease. Yes. Now, what, what is trotter's triad? Uh, trotter's triad is um, it's, uh, trigeminal neuralgia with ipsilateral soft pal palsy. Uh, with the conductive hearing loss due to serous artery dyspnea. Is it a, a palatal palsy or is it something else? Even in uh, internet, it is written like that, but that is wrong. Conductive hearing loss due to serous artery dyspnea, ipsilateral facial pain due to involvement of the trigeminal nerve. And what is the third component? Ipsilateral palatal palsy. No, I... actually, actually it is ipsilateral immobility and elevation of the soft palate. All these are due to infiltration, not due to muscle paralysis. Okay. So okay. then another one, which all cranial nerves can be affected in nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Um, three, four, five, six. So um, all cranial nerves can be affected. If a, all cranial nerves are involved in an esophageal carcinoma, what is it called? Carson syndrome. Okay, good. Now, uh, you should have told, it was perfect, I told, good presentation. But you know things also, but examination of oral cavity, you should have told about the teeth. Carey's teeth, is it present, absent? Because you already told. Uh, after diagnosis, before sending for radiotherapy, you will uh, send for dental. What is the purpose? Uh, to rule out dental caries, um, to, to avoid osteoradionecrosis. After... What are the types of osteoradionecrosis? I don't know. Sir. It's primary and secondary. You should read that. Yeah, it can be asked. Then, uh, you get, along with the investigations, you should have told about Biotron oreogram also in the okay. initial phase itself. Why? We already know that patient has got conductive hearing loss. But uh, we are doing the uh, that. Is it for to confirm that it is serous otitis media? No. Yeah. Because we are planning to give medication. Isn't it? Cisplatin. So we want to know what is the baseline hearing and uh, uh, to check whether there is a toxicity later on. Then again, one point that you missed was you didn't tell about during clinical presentation about distant metastasis. Uh, you told about ENT examination, neck, and uh, then proceeded with uh, skipped the distant metastasis. You are concentrating on the distant metastasis symptoms. Isn't it? You told, repeatedly told, there is no bone pain. So if you are examining, you told bone is the commonest site. What is the commonest site in the bone? In nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Spine. Where? Which part of the spine? Because you should specifically look for that. Is it cervical? That's so it is, it is the thoracolumbar spines. Okay, so you should specifically look for tenderness. Then you should look for hepatomegaly. You should auscultate. 
uh, chest. These are things you should have told that should have made it uh, a presentation for which uh, examiners will give, will give you distinction. I'm telling to improve. Okay. okay. Then another thing, this patient was a chronic smoker, isn't it? Yes. And he presented with bilateral neck node metastasis. Which other ENT malignancies can present with bilateral neck metastasis? Uh, any malignancies involving the midline structures like floor of mouth, uh, epiglottis, post cricoid, post pharyngeal wall? Can you be very specific? Nasopharynx is one, other sites? You uh, mean nasal. base of tongue? Yeah, base of tongue, uh, floor of mouth, epiglottis, post cricoid area, posterior pharyngeal okay. wall. Thyroid, can it present with bilateral metastasis? Thyroid malignancy? Yes. Okay, so all these sites. Now, he's a chronic smoker also. So, is it always better? We already saw a growth in the nasopharynx. Still, any other endoscopy you should have told for completion's sake? Uh, video laryngoscopy. Pan endoscopy, Pan isn't it? Yes. Oh, okay. And the last thing, we know bilateral, uh, sorry, bimodal presentation in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Both the examiners trust what is the importance of examination of the ear. Especially in younger patients, after radiotherapy, it may go off. There may not be recurrence, but what is the main problem? They will be coming back to you. It is adesiotitis media retraction pockets. So, um, which ventilation tube you will prefer? Um, T tube. Yes, because simple grommets, they will, uh, will be extruded in short span. So you should always plan for long-term ventilation tubes. Uh, there are so many questions, but since there are so many examiners, I'm stopping. And once again, very good uh, presentation. Okay. Okay. Sharon. Hello, Shibu. Uh, yeah, sir, I'm Shibu John. Yes, yes, sir. I concur. I concur with uh, Satish. The presentation was very good. In fact, a uh, lot of times when we uh, when we give feedback, we just say ah, the presentation was good and all. Right? But I think genuinely the presentation was very good. Okay, keep it sir, up. Sir, then sorry, sir. I can't I... hear you properly. Am I audible now? Yes, now it's okay. audible. Okay, okay. I was just okay. I was just appreciating your presentation, sir. Thank you. Oh, thank okay, you. sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, your presentation was genuinely good. Okay. Thanks. Then number number two is I would appreciate uh, Ajayan, uh, uh, Binu, and Pramod for getting this case. Because I think this is an examiner's delight. With the findings, I think this is really a long case examiner's delight. Ajayan, congratulations for the case. And then, uh, then minor points. I think you have answered almost everything. Sadish, in fact, added majority of the points to be asked along with that. Possibly, uh, you told all cranials can be involved in malignancy nasal weddings, which is the most common? Sixth cranial. Fifth cranial, which is the least common? Eighth cranial. Is it eighth or second? Eighth, eighth cranial. Okay, okay. Fifth, fifth is the most common, followed by sixth. Then the least common is second cranial now, eighth, seventh cranial, eighth cranial now, and seventh cranial now. Now, what is the mechanism of uh, uh, your cranial nerve palsy, lower cranial nerve palsy? This patient has hypoglossal nerve palsy. What is the mechanism of hypogl hypoglossal nerve palsy? Uh, when the tumor involves the parapharyngeal space, especially the post styloid compartment. Okay. How, how, how does it involve the parapharyngeal space? Uh, because uh, when the posterolateral extension of the tumor why? Why? What? What anatomical peculiarity? There is a devoid of bone, so it can easily spread to the parapharyngeal. Is it devoid of bone or something else? What is that area known as? Area of spread is known as something. From the nasal findings, lateral spread occurs through an area. What is that area known as? 
there is an area between the skull base and the uppermost part of superior constrictor, which is devoid That's of muscle. Sinus. Sinus, uh, of sinus of morgagne. This is the reason why it fits with a paraphyngeal space. Okay. Again, this case had three, four, six cranial palsies. You agree? Yes, sir. Why? What was the reason? Uh, because of the cavernous sinus involvement. Okay, very good. It is because of cavernous sinus involvement. And then, is there any other situation in malignancy in your where you can have three, four, six palsy together other than cavernous sinus? Superior orbital fissure involvement. It, is, it's, it's, it should be orbital apex. Okay, involvement of orbital apex. Orbital apex involvement. You can get the uh, all. The... And finally, can you just summarize? See, do you think malignancy in nasopharynx is different from other malignancies of the head and neck? Yes, sir. So, yes, so sir. How, how, how is it different? Just to summarize. Then possibly this is for all the postgraduates. Just summarize. Why is it different? How is it different? Uh, because it is a... Uh... It has a very uh, variety of clinical presentation and it is very difficult to diagnose because of its deep location. Is it, is it variety of clinical presentation or is it specifically nodal presentation? Most common presentation is nodal rather than nodal. the primary organ of involvement. That is one. Then second one? Uh, it is uh, difficult to assess because uh, as compared to other areas in the head and neck to diagnose. Uh, what, what about the etiology? Uh, Epstein Barr virus. Majority of adenic malignancy is smoking. This is tobacco. This is actually uh, Epstein Barr virus. And what about racial predilection? Uh, it is endemic in southern China. Yeah, yeah, that is southern Chinese population. Yeah, that is southern Chinese population. And then what about the histological type? Is it different from other adenic malignancies? Um, Keratinizing and non-keratinizing type. The non-keratinizing undifferentiated malignancy. Different from, it is different from undifferentiated malignancy of, uh, for example, uh, sinonasal malignancy. It's grossly different. Actually, there are more, it is more, more something like a lymphoepithelioma. So that's again different as compared to other head and neck malignancies. Okay. okay. So that is a summary. Anyway, very good. Very good presentation. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hello. Uh, Ajay, can I hear uh, Yeah. Uh, Sharon, it's a really a good presentation. And you are so confident also. Keep it up. Huh? And uh, just one point, uh, your diagnosis, uh, the patient had a deviated nasal septum also, no? You could have asked yes. uh, that also, okay? Your uh, ear, nose, throat presentation have you should not uh, miss that okay it is a real good presentation keep it up okay. here okay thank you dr divya is there divya uh, yes sir yes sir sharon <laughs> you did extremely good you covered all the aspect of nasopharyngeal carcinoma we are i heard your history your examination and the discussion part was uh, we covered all the aspects of the treatment and how we evaluate. Even the spread of disease was also beautifully explained. Uh, going to the molecular level, the Epstein Barr virus uh, that uh, Ajay Kumar said has beautifully explained the lytic stage of the disease. So it was a fabulous class. It was very nice. And uh, hats off to Sharon. She did extremely good. The approach was very good. She was confident and she answered almost all the questions. And uh, I congratulate all the teachers who, uh, Binu sir, Ajay sir, Prabhu sir, and all the teachers who supported her and guided her in the right way. Extremely good, sir. Extremely good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Divya, I very good support from uh, uh, ENT department to Random Medical College because uh, uh, the for an uninterrupted uh, presentation. And Venu sir, uh, Sujit, uh, Anuraj, all are behind that. So she's actually presenting from Trivandrum. She's now undergoing training in RCC. She, so okay. She's not presenting from Trichur. She's presenting from ENT department, Trivandrum Medical College. So thanks for that also. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ajahn, sir, one minute. Uh, yeah. Uh, on my behalf, no, I would like to thank uh, two of my close friends, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar and uh, Prithimesh, for uh, chairing this session. 
both of them were like uh, absolutely they were very cooperative they agreed at the first uh, request itself uh, ajay uh, is my batchmate at calicut and he has been instrumental in elevating the department of radiotherapy to its current uh, status uh, with his persistent efforts pratmesh was my co resident at km during my MD and during my ms days and i have been watching with awe and pride his rise in his career and profession pratmesh thanks a lot ajay ajay also thank you very much thank you Good thank challenge. you opinu and it was a really a delight uh, delightful uh, evening and uh, i'm really impressed by dr shirin's knowledge of uh, radiotherapy okay <laughs> all the things you are really uh, you did well uh, thank you sir uh, binu sir binu sir thank you binu for the invit invitation binu you binu was my senior at uh, km hospital so we learned a lot from seeing these guys you know manage the ward the surgery thank you binu thank you sir, uh, sir one one word sir we are here uh, pratimesh sir and uh, ajay sir was very well they asked the questions in a very nice way touching all the aspects of nasal pharyngeal carcinoma and sincere uh, appreciation to the examiners taking the good points from them extracting the points from the, the candidate also they were very nice to the candidate and the way they approached the candidate was also well appreciated thanks very much pramod hello thank you and thank you dr ajay kumar and dr patmesh thank you thank, thank you pramod discussion okay. thank you once again on behalf of ent department prashant thank you everybody have a good night very good night very good night thank you so